Hi there. Um, this is chapter 6.3, Periodic Trends. Welcome. Now, we see a weather map, more or less, here. And we can see how we have the different patterns throughout the United States. So there are trends that a lot of times the weather travels from the west coast to the east coast or up from the Gulf up to the northeast. But basically, weather can be plotted through computer models into what the trends of future weather will be. Excuse me. And that is true also um, with the periodic table. So the first thing we're going to talk about is atomic size. How does atomic size change as we go through the periodic table? All right. The way we measure atomic size is usually we measure the distance between two nuclei because it's very hard to determine where the end of the electron cloud is located. It is basically going to be between the two things is going to be the diameter, so half of that will be the radius. And that's how we determine the radius of an atom. Okay, since all of the ones that are shown in the picture are identical, it's very easy to determine the size of these um, radii. And you can see that they're all in the picometer range, which is 10 to the minus 12 meters. So it's a very, very small distance that we're talking about. So what is the definition? The definition is the atomic radius is one half the distance between the two nuclei of two atoms of the same element when the atoms are joined. Okay. Very, very simple. As I mentioned, it was very, very small. 1 times 10 to the minus 12. I'm going to rewrite what they have here because what's happening is they're saying it's 1 trillion, it's 10 to the 12, but it, this is 1 trillion okay, of a meter. So that would be 1 trillion picometers in 1 Meter. So a picometer, let me write that for you, is 1 p.m. equals 1 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. Because pico means 10 to the minus 12. Okay? So let's look at iodine. The iodine distance is 280 between the two nuclei, so that means that we basically have, for our iodine, we have a radius of 140, so the distance between here and here, basically. So it's very hard to do that, so what we do is we measure this distance and then take the midpoint, okay? Now, here's the trend. If we look at the periodic table, we know and I'm just going to draw, oops, I'm going to draw a simple periodic table here. All right, so here's my simple periodic table. As we go down a group, we're adding more and more every period. We add a new shell, so it comes then as no surprise that it's going to get larger. So the radius increases. Radius increases as you go down a column. And actually what happens if we want to do it this way, I usually try to make it all the same way. If we go from right to left, it increases, which means if we go from left to right, it will decrease. Okay? Why is that happening is as we go across a period, we're adding more protons. Okay? And those protons are centered in the center. We're adding electrons in the same shell. So what happens is there's more positive charge pulling all these electrons towards the center. So it gets smaller as you go from left to right. So if you want to get the trend for atomic size, my arrows show the direction in which they get larger. As you go from right to left, they get larger, and he goes from top to bottom. Okay, if we look at this chart, we can see what happens. 
So if we start at hydrogen and we go up and finally we get up to lithium, okay? So this is a new, this is the first rung of our n equals one. So these are very small. Then we jump up to the next ring and there's lithium, but then we're adding protons and drawing those things back in, get to neon at the very end, back to sodium, it gets big again, comes back down, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one of the things you will notice is when we start having some things with like that, we have some outliers, which we'll discuss. It usually has to do with electron configuration and the spreading out of electrons, okay, is why those deviations occur. But the trend is that as you go basically down a group, you're, I mean, across a, across a period, you're going to get smaller as you go up a group. These are all group one. Notice how it's increasing. Hydrogen and helium are a little weird because that's the first row. It doesn't quite follow the same thing, although, because helium's a little bit bigger. All right. So group trends in atomic size. As the atomic number increases within a group, the charge on the nucleus increases and the number of occupied energy levels increases. These variables affect atomic size in opposite ways. So in a group, okay, what's the big factor? It's the number of occupied energy levels in a group. Okay, in a period, the other fact is going to be um, changing that, okay, because the charge of the nucleus increases, okay? Group trends in atomic size. The increase in positive charge draws an electron closer to the nucleus, okay? The increase of the number of occupied orbitals shields electrons at the highest energy levels from being attracted, and this shielding effect is greater than the effect of the increased nuclear charge. So basically what's happening as you're putting these electrons in outer shells, they're farther away, so the nuclear charge doesn't affect them as much. And that's why they get, are allowed to get bigger and bigger. That's a, basically the reason. I gave you the trend saying that as you go down, you're actually getting more rings, so to speak, but you're also getting something else. You're getting, um, definitely, you're getting more than just rings, you're getting um, the nuclear charge pulling them closer, but now that has less effect. Now across the period, on the other hand, your shielding effect is constant, all right? So this is an important term, this idea of shielding, okay? This shielding effect is constant because you are at the same ring, okay? So if you look out here, if you're out here and you're putting electrons in, they're the same distance basically from the center. So they're going to have more effect, okay, as you as electrons, you're adding protons, so the nuclear charge pulls the electrons in from the highest energy level. You're not adding rings, okay? So that's why as you go across the period, the, it gets smaller. There's more nuclear charge pulling that ring in. So here's one way of looking at it. I showed you that I like to draw it. Okay, this is increasing, decreasing, but I like to draw this arrow. Okay, that didn't like it. Okay, let me try it again. So I like to draw this arrow showing increase. Okay, it just makes sense to me to go both the same way. So when you're trying to look at these different trends, you have an easy way to remember it in your mind. Okay, so what are the trends for atomic size? Okay, think about it. We drew, we drew the following. Definitely when you go down a group, larger. And when you go from right to left, larger. And going this way, of course, then would be smaller. And this way, would also be smaller. Okay, so to summarize,
Tomate size increases from top to bottom within a group and decreases from left to right across a period. How do ions form? Now this is getting us ready for the next topic, which is going to be bonding. Um, and ions form by the loss or gain of electrons. Okay, so we're going to talk about losing and gaining electrons. Okay, and what is an ion? An ion is an atom, a group of atoms that has a positive or negative charge. Okay. Now, an atom that we've been talking about, an element on the periodic table, uh, table is electronically neutral because it has equal numbers of protons and electrons. But, for instance, um, if we look at sodium, it has 11 protons and 11 electrons, and they cancel out, so they go away. So we notice here that the charge on an atom of sodium is zero. That tells us it's the neutral atom. Now, what happens is the whole idea, I told you, the way you spell chemistry is E-L-E-C-T-R-O-N-S. Well, that's because they're leaving or coming or they're being shared. So they're transferring electrons between atoms. So metals... Okay, things on the left side of the periodic table, like sodium, tend to lose electrons. And they are lost from the highest occupied energy levels. That's why we saw that every metal in group one, their S1 electron was the last electron added to their outer energy level. So they're basically going to lose that electron. So here we are. Here's sodium. Okay. And sodium is going to lose one electron. So what happens is when it loses this electron, it basically, if we draw here, again, this just helps you understand it more. If you think of our energy levels this area now is not available anymore because that electron's gone. So our atom, when it becomes an ion, gets smaller for sodium. And what's happening is these here even go in more because now there's 11 protons which pull these electrons in. So an ion with a positive charge we call a cation, okay, meow, cation, that's a way to remember it, okay, cation, so that's a cation. The charge that the cation is written is a number plus a plus sign, okay, if it's one, you don't have to write the one, you can just write the plus. Now for nonmetals, something else happens, in nonmetals, what happens in a nonmetal is that they gain electrons. So, for instance, a chloride ion will get 18 electrons instead of 17, so it has one more electron, so they want to kind of spread it out more, so then the ion gets bigger. Okay, so for nonmetals, in the case of nonmetals, you're going to get bigger ions. which means our trends are not going to be as easily defined as they were for um, the atoms. So what is a negative charge called for an ion? I like to think of it this way. Okay. I call it an anion, and you know a little bit of this that I kind of make myself remember it is, I said cations, okay, cat, ion, positive charge, anion, sometimes I think of that as an ant, but anion, this is N, which stands for negative. So that's a way of remembering cation and anion. 
Okay, what type of element tends to form anions and what type tends to form cations? It all has to do with the periodic table. Anions have to do with nonmetals, so on the right-hand side of the periodic table. Cations tend to be metals, the left side of the periodic table. So nonmetals tend to form anions, metals tend to form cations. Okay, so let's look at ionization energy. What is ionization energy? Ionization energy is the energy needed to remove the first or any electron from the atom. Okay, so we've already learned that they have energy to go to higher energy levels. What happens um, when they get so much energy, they can actually leave the atom? That is called ionization energy when it becomes an ion. Okay, we measure these things only in the gaseous state, so we're not talking about when they're in the solid. So, but, it, but it still is very useful for us. It gives us the general ideas that we want. Okay, and so usually we're talking about the first ionization energy, which is the first one to lose. So if it's very low, it's very easy to lose that first electron. The second electron is always going to be harder than the first. Okay, now the trend is, okay, ionization energy decreases from top to bottom within a group. So if we look at our periodic table, okay, we're going to decrease the amount of energy okay so if we make our periodic table up here this means decrease ionization energy now let's think about it this side it's very easy right? This side it's very hard because these are the nonmetals. So again, I could make my drawing like this, decreasing ionization energy as you go from right to left, but you know they're going to say increasing ionization energy. And it's also going to increase if we go this way. So First ionization tends to decrease from top to bottom within a group and increase from left to right. All right, Or you can do it the way I do it. Increasing is going to be from right to left and from top to bottom. It's always easier for me to draw one directional things. Now here's some data. Okay, We can see, let's look at hydrogen and helium. It's very difficult to you know, decide that because they're non-metals. So let's start, start with lithium. Lithium, you don't need too much. Sodium, you need even less. And potassium, you need even less energy because that electron in that S1 orbital is further and further from the nucleus, so it makes it easier and easier for it to get rid of it. Let's look at beryllium, magnesium, and calcium. Again, it follows the same trend. It's decreasing as we go down the family. Okay, this will also help you predict what ions elements form. If it has a very low ionization energy, it will form a positive charge. And the other thing we can look at, these group ones, look at their second ionization energy. There's not even there. Well, it is. It's right here. Okay, that's how much it's almost. It's over a thousand times as, I mean, a thousand more energy units to get the second one because lithium is going to be what plus one. Beryllium, yes, it goes higher, it just doubles. But look at the third one, how much more it is. So these two are relatively easy to get rid of, but this one's a lot harder. Okay, if we go to fluorine, fluorine, look at it that, okay? They're very hard to begin with. So group one tends to go to plus one. It's very hard to get to plus two. So here we can look at the group trends and ionization energy. Again, hydrogen, helium, hydrogen, a little bit, 
less than helium. But then when we get down here, we see the trend is increasing all the ways to neon if we look at first ionization energy, okay? So it increases. Now there's a couple of little places where there's dips, okay? This would be because we are starting to fill the P orbital and this is half filled P orbitals, okay? So there's a little dips, but in general, we're increasing as we're growing across the period. And as we look in group one, we see how these decrease. And even with your noble gases, they decrease. Okay? So that gives you an idea of what happens to ionization as you go down from a group. So, so far we know that atomic size increases, the atomic number increases within a group, and ionization decreases as you go down a group. And since that's the case, the electron is held less and less tightly the bigger the atom is, so it's easier to remove that electron, so less energy is required to remove electron from the energy level when it's further out. And as we can say in the same period, we're adding more and more positive charge in the nucleus. Those electrons are held more tightly than those on the left. So therefore, the ionization energy is higher to overcome that attractive charge. Okay? So that's explained by the shielding effect. Okay. And as we said, as you go across a period, the shielding effect remains constant, so there's an increase in attraction for the nucleus, all right? And there's their summary again. Remember, I like to just say if it increases, it decreases this way. It increases when we go up and over. Okay, so now let's talk about ionic size. As I said, ionic size is a little harder to predict. It kind of follows the same general pattern for atomic size, but there's a slight difference. Okay, and so cations will always get smaller than their atoms, and anions will always be larger than their atoms. So we don't have as nice of a switch as we go through the periodic table. All right, so if we look, okay, if we look at our periodic table for ions, what we have is we'll have okay, they'll get larger no matter what as you go down. And they'll get smaller and then they get larger again, okay? But then it gets small again, okay? So it's like when it turns to nonmetals, it gets bigger all of a sudden, and then in general it gets small again. But the smallest is going to be for the metals there. Okay, as I said, in the groups, they're going to get, um, actually the potassium ion is going to be larger than lithium sodium. So you're going to still have a smaller ion compared to the atom, but it's still going to be bigger than the ion above it. Okay, so what we see here is we see that we're having a increase in size. Okay, we have basically representative elements, if they're metals, lose their outermost electrons. Okay, so it has fewer occupied energy levels, whereas for um, nonmetals, they have the same number of um, energy levels as they started with, but, but there's more electrons within those, so the electrons are able to shield the nuclear charge from the remaining electrons, so it tends to spread them out, because those negative charges are also going to be repulsive. Okay, so if we see this picture here, you can kind of see what I said. 
if you look at lithium, beryllium, boron, it gets smaller. And then, you know, you, this is your atom, atoms. And then here's your ions getting smaller and smaller. Carbon, you don't see as much, but when you get the electrons, then it gets big, but then it starts to get smaller again. Okay? And there's the little picture. Okay, what are the transfer ionic size? As you go down a group, increasing size. As you go from left to right, generally it gets smaller. It gets a little bigger when you first get to the anions, and then that gets smaller. Okay, another term is electronegativity. And this has to do with um, a unit called electronegativity that tells us what's the likelihood of something um, being attractive for um, electrons in its outer levels. So it's the ability of an atom of an element to attract electrons when the atom is in a compound. And scientists use factors such as ionization energy to calculate these values for electronegativity. They're very artificial, but we've set a certain number, and they're easy to work with, okay? And that's really what it is. Pauline had a lot to do with it. So if we look at it, things like lithium and cesium, they have lower numbers, but then you get up to fluorine, and fluorine has 4.0. These are called Pauline units. So fluorine has the highest electronegativity. So electronegativity will increase from left to right and will decrease from top to bottom. So again, if we do what I like to do is let's see what's happening. Let's go in increasing order. So if we're going to look at how things increase, they increase as you go from the bottom to the top and from left to right. And they decrease in the opposite way. So metals at the far left of the periodic ta table have low values, whereas nonmetals at the far right have high values, and the values at the top right will be the highest, and their values at the um, bottom left will be the lowest. And transition metals aren't really changing much because you're dealing with the four the S electrons in the outer levels, so they pretty much stay the same. I mentioned that about cesium. So it tends to be very, very reactive. And fluorine tends to be very, very reactive. And that's because it will attract electrons from other elements. Cesium will give away its electron the most easiest, easiest, easiestly. Okay. And this figure is showing all the different trends. You might want to take a screenshot of that. And as I said for electronegativity value, they decrease from top to bottom within a group, and they increase from left to right across a period. Okay, what are the four trends we talked about? Atomic size, ionic size. We talked about electronegativity, ionization energy, And that's it. Those are the four things we talked about. Here are the key concepts. And here are the definitions for your notes. Stop the video and take these down. Some more notes. And the big idea. Atomic size, ionization energy, ionic size, and electronegativity are trends that vary across periods and groups of the periodic table. These trends can be explained by variations in atomic structure. The increase in nuclear charge within groups and across periods explains many trends. Within groups, an increase in electron shielding has a significant effect on these trends. And that's it. See you next time.